Thank you, Adam Joanne. Thank you so much, so much. Our New Testament reading comes from Acts 11, 1, 1 through, excuse me, Acts 11, 1 through 18. And I am going to read from my little raggedy Bible here. Now, the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter began to explain, to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa, praying and in a trance, I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners. And it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw a four-footed animal, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men, sent to me from Caesarea, arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given us has given even 
to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. This is the word. Thanks be to God. I wasn't able to put the sermon title on the outside, but the title of this sermon is called Even the Gentiles. But as I was preparing for this particular sermon, I happened to come across a, an article, and it was written in 2021, and it was in the edition of a magazine called Glamour. And it featured an entire anthology of 74 truths and set and stories to live by. And so it caught my attention. And the first article I read was written by a Samantha Berry. She was editor and chief at that time of Glamour magazine. And one of the first articles within the periodical was about Bishop Catherine Jeffords. Scory was her last name. She was, a, or still is, a preacher and a speaker, and she was presiding bishop of the, U, of the U.S. based Episcopal Church from 2006 to 2015. And the title of the article, and this really caught my attention, was Tolerance Begins with church. And of course, many of you know this, but many people didn't realize that, you know, women had been leaders in the Christian communities since the time of Jesus. And the, one of the first witness of the resurrection was Mary Magdalene. And however, when Christianity became the state religion of Rome in the fourth century, those people women, I mean, began to be pushed aside. And in the centuries that followed, women were almost universally excluded from formal leadership. Some were persecuted and even executed when they attempted to assert their callings to religious leadership. Now, our author goes on to state that there is still some considerable resistance we can choose to celebrate progress, the author says. And that caught my attention too. Sometimes in the news, we always see the negative. Why don't we choose to celebrate the positive? We can give thanks for the courage of those who give voice to their experience or their marginalization or harassment or abuse or exclusion, but we can give thanks to those who claim their God-given gifts for leadership and give thanks for all who elect and support them. Now, Peter got a lot of flack for encouraging the Gentiles to be Christians. The Gentiles were not Jewish, you see, and it could have been anywhere. But the word goy, I'm sure some of you have heard the word goy. It's a Yiddish word for Gentile. And goy also means nation. And the term Gentile can also be synonymous, or I'll just say a synonym, for heathen or pagan. Hmm. And the word Gentile is derived from the Latin word gentilis, or a belonging to the same nation. Now, during biblical times, the Gentiles were aliens from the worship rights and privileges of Israel. And therefore, you have one of the first instances of us and them. And that thought process, us, and them, Notice 
is how you say us, you bring everybody in and you say them, those over there, pushing them away. But God's ways and in God's words are now part of the repentance that leads to life for all of us, all of us, one nation. And throughout history, much of our human contact has come from where we sit in the world. Now, you all are sitting right now, and every single one of you has an opinion. And I can just about bet that every opinion in here is not the same as the next. What you think? Some, some, and then some not, right? Well, I kind of like history, and I was thinking about what that really stood for and what we've gone through as a world. And you all remember Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill when I was a little girl. Overseas, Churchill was like a hero. But Stalin and Roosevelt and Churchill, all allies during World War II, saw things very differently from one another. And Stalin in particular did not trust the other two as it pertained to how he saw the future of the Soviets. However, in 1942, was anybody here in 1942? Raise your hand if you would. A few people. In 1942, less than a month after Pearl Harbor and the U.S. and Great Britain and the USSR, they signed this declaration by the United Nations that yoked them together in a grand alliance of their mutual survival. Now let's think about that. A grand alliance of mutual survival. Well, mutual survival, the mutual survival of all parties involved, the Bible and the Torah and the Quran all speak to mutual survival of the faithful. And when Peter told of his experience of the Lord's guidance and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the house of Cornelius, and he said this, who was I that I could withstand God? End quote. The other apostles were convinced that Peter had acted correctly and praised God for his grace to Gentiles. And thus, the apostle Peter opened the door to mutual salvation to all. Now, we have today the power to change should we have hurt someone in the process of our faith growth. And in fact, we have AA that meets here, NA as well. And I'm not sure if it's, you know, you got your 12 steps. And it might be the seventh or the eighth, but if you are hurting someone or hurt someone in the past, you are to go back and try to make amends. So those of you that are unfamiliar with the 12 steps, that is part of understanding who you are in your healing. Amen? Amen. Well, we also are given from God this thing called free will. And we can change things. And Peter was doing just that. He was opening the door for people to understand each other and not to do the us and them thing, but to come together with our God. To come together as a community. To come together as one. And interesting enough, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill were doing the same thing in a different way. It's a political way, but it was a historical way for 
the survival. And so in order for us to survive as individuals, we don't have to think exactly the same way, but we can be forgiven and repent and start anew. And so the title of this sermon is Even the Gentiles. I almost said even me, even you. We can start again. And in that same book, there was an article that I thought was very interesting and it came to my attention and it's called, I Abandoned My Faith. But I thought it came from a, a specific position. You know how we're, we're all raised. Some of you were raised, how many people raised here in Florida? Anybody? Born and raised in Florida. Okay, we have some Floridians right here and up there. Anybody born and raised in Detroit? Anywhere up Pennsylvania? Ah, oh, we got some Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Anywhere else? Where were you born and raised? Ohio. Ohio? New York? Georgia? Massachusetts? Massachusetts? Connecticut? India? India? Alabama and Alaska, Kentucky and Mississippi. Some people raise over here, and then they go over here and get raised again. Huh? What'd you say? New York and Connecticut. New York and Connecticut. So we all come from a different, I'll just say, upbringing. That is quite interesting. But this woman, her name was Megan Phelps, and she wrote this article. And I wanted to read it to you, it's real short. And it says, I abandoned my faith. I abandoned my faith. My life's unraveling took place on an ordinary, brilliant afternoon in July of 2012. A Wednesday, I was painting the walls of a friend's basement when suddenly it dawned on me, the world was right and my views were wrong. I remember thinking it's strange that a mind, an entire world, could shift so drastically, so spontaneously. I was born and raised in the infamous Westboro Baptist Church, a congregation started by my grandfather and consisting of almost entirely of my extended family. I've been protesting gays since the age of five, preaching God's hatred for sinners on picket lines across the country. Westboro's fire and brimstone message was the air I breathed all my life. But after joining Twitter at the ripe age of 23, I encountered people who challenged my beliefs and unearthed contradictions my blind faith admits. Why did we call for the death penalty for gay people when Jesus said only sinless people should cast stones? How could we claim to love our neighbor while also praying for God to destroy them? That afternoon, I felt the last traces of my zeal for Westboro extinguish, extinguish under the pile of mounting doubt. However, I had come to a series of terrifying conclusions. We were wrong. I had spent my life ant antagonizing vulnerable people for no good reason. I had to leave, and though I was afraid, I knew that in the strangest way, Westboro brought me there. My family taught me to be honest. Even when the truth was painful, they taught me to stand up for what I believe in, no matter what it would cost me. And the church gave me the tools I needed to see hate, even my own, as an obstacle, but as 
as an, not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity to advocate for empathy. Let me read that last statement. Even my own, not as an obstacle, but as an opportunity to advocate for empathy. Our word here says today, then God has given even the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. My goodness. And send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, and he will give you a message which you and your entire household will be saved. And I began to speak in the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if then God gave them the same gift that he gave us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder Ladies and gentlemen of God, we have gone through so much in the last couple of years. We have gone through COVID. We've gone through deaths. We've gone through maybe even a loss in your own personal lives. We have gone through so much. And when we think about what it is to be a community of faith. As different as you sit in that chair from where you were born, with maybe seven people only being born in the state of Florida out of all of you, we sit here and remember that we're all a little different. We came from different perspectives. And Peter, all those millenniums ago said, open the door to others. Open your eyes, your faith, your soul, allowing to understand God's word with grace and mercy. This week has been a hard week. Just personally, we lost my sister-in-law and we also now lost an uncle, one of Luther's uncles. So when I go back next week, I get to go to two, two services and get to celebrate two lives. And that's the way I look at it. Yes, it's a loss, but it's a celebration. One was a police officer for all his life. That was his uncle. And the other was a, a bank president for American, for American, what is that, America Bank? Bank of America. Bank of America. And she was there for many, many years as a, a bank president there. And these two people knew each other, but instead of the tears, and I'm not saying that we can't have tears, but I'm saying that they were very different. They were very different people. And we'll celebrate them differently, I'm sure. But we will also open the doors to family members, as you all know, when you go to the wedding in the family, there's always some kind of mess. Something, somebody didn't like so-and-so over 30 years ago, and I remember what you did mean to me. So they walk in and so forth. I say today, Peter opened with the Holy Spirit. He gave grace to those that were put out. He gave grace to those who did not have the right to the rituals. And they actually did. Because they 
because they were also people of God. And so on this day, when you leave this space, I encourage you to dig down deep, figure out what is that in me that I can't let go. What is it in me that I can't let go of that thing you did to me 10 years ago? And say, even God has forgiven me. I'm going to give it to the Lord. And I'm going to say, not only even the Gentiles, but even me, even me. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.